Hi everyone, my name is Andy Jurek and I teach guitar at UNC Asheville. This past November I released Strive, my first recording for solo classical guitar. Now, I love the classical guitar and I love so much of the music that's been composed for the instrument, but for Strive I wanted to do something a little different. I wanted to do something a little special. So for this album I recorded a collection of my arrangements for solo guitar. This album collects tunes I love that were specifically written for other instruments. Piano, cello, marimba, sometimes even a full rock band. All music that I reimagined for solo guitar. Some of the music here blends different musical identities, from traditional and contemporary classical to jazz to Brazilian music. Some of these tracks explore the interesting connective musical material between classical and popular worlds. Others are respectful reimaginings of tunes filtered through a purely instrumental lens. In short, I collected a bunch of music that I love, and with a great amount of respect, I stole it all and translated it to the guitar. In this video, I'd like to discuss a few of my favorite pieces on the album. I'd like to discuss what the pieces are, why they intrigue me, and why I decided to arrange them for guitar, and in some cases, how I made those arrangements work out. There are three specific pieces I'd like to discuss. Julio by Mark Sommer, Strive to be Happy by Ivan Trevino, and Chorale by Nicholas Walker. To begin, I'd like to discuss the first track on the album, Julio. was composed for cello by Mark Sommer, a founding member of the two-time Grammy award-winning Turtle Island Quartet. The Turtle Island Quartet are a string quartet known for genre hopping between musical worlds, primarily classical and jazz, an excellent summary for Sommer's musical career. I left the Winnipeg Symphony after three years and was playing with a guitar player who was pretty much a street musician and we just we just started playing bluegrass tunes and Beatles tunes and um, some j some jazz. Um, he was a songwriter, just did a lot of different things. Played at the Winnipeg Folk Festival and did all kinds of music. I was in a new music ensemble, a rock ensemble, played um, a Brahms sextet with the principal cellist of the orchestra. He has collaborated and performed with Paquito de Rivera, the Winnipeg Symphony, Kirk Whalem, the Oakland Symphony, singer-songwriter Tony Childs, and the Chamber Symphony of San Francisco. Julio is undoubtedly Summer's most famous composition, and it's rightly become an iconic piece in the cello's repertoire. So Julio started as a as a melody on the piano, with with a you know a kind of bass lines in the in the left hand. The song is brimming with energy fueled by its driving pulse and brilliant melody. Written for the cello, it arguably hints at classical origins, yet its syncopated rhythms and harmonic shifts are something out of modern jazz, akin to Pat Metheny and Egberto Gismonti. There's even some extended techniques like tapping, a decidedly non-classical convention. Likewise, coming from a bowed string instrument, you can even hear shades of Celtic music in its melodic twists and turns. I basically took the melody, I started making variations on it. I had a real time crunch. I probably, my memory is that I had three weeks and and, um, and I didn't, didn't write it out. So I was just improvising, codifying the improvisations, you know, kind of keeping track of it in my head of, of how it was gonna go. And it just kind of came out pretty well. Julio also includes an improvisation section something you don't often typically encounter in many classical pieces. Classical musicians today traditionally don't improvise, so for reluctant performers, Summer included a small, fully notated cadenza. That said, some of the most compelling versions I've heard have taken advantage of this improvisation section, often crafting entirely new dimensions on the music. Um, a lot of people, different classical players are playing it and I'm hoping that it's a bridge to other styles of music that require and involve more improvisation. 
you know, levels of improvisation in that piece. In translating Julio from cello to guitar, from four strings to six strings, I had the opportunity to add some additional notes and additional chords, things to help fill out the texture a little bit. Likewise, the main melody, it's so memorable, I'm so fond of it, that I chose to repeat it a few additional times. And each subsequent time I repeat it, I start to add notes or maybe change the harmony a little bit. Things to just create a little bit of variety. Uh, and finally, I really wanted to explore the tonal colors that are available on the classical guitar to really explore the space between uh, really abrasive, brittle sounds and much darker, richer colors.
Strive to be Happy was written for Marimba by Texas-based composer, performer, and writer Ivan Trevino. Despite his relative youth, Trevino has made remarkable strides in the percussion world, with his music having been performed in 25 countries across five continents. I grew up in a really musical family, and my father is a songwriter, and he performed a lot. He plays guitar, and uh, he sings. And we had a band growing up with a lot of my family members. Um, it was sort of like a Tejano, gospel, country western, hodgepodge of genres. That's but I, cool. I, I, I sort of feel like it um, captures a lot of sort of the uh, Latinx um, experience in South Texas where I grew up. In addition to his composing and solo performing, Trevino's the percussionist for Break of Reality, a rather excellent cello rock chamber group. Yet, despite the diversity in his composing and performing activities, Trevino finds more connections and relationships in his musical life than divisions. I really sort of feel like I'm a songwriter, sort of just stuck in this classical music world. Um, people call me a composer, and I think that's right sometimes, but a lot of times I do feel like a songwriter just writing concert music. The title, Strive to be Happy, comes from a 1927 prose poem, Desiderata, by American poet Max Ehrman. Musically, the work is in perpetual motion a seemingly endless flurry of sixteenth notes that develop beautiful harmonies that seem to swell and recede, something later contrasted with a really playful, really joyous melody. So I tried to create a really meditative, sort of simple, um, resonant sort of sound with the marimba, uh, with really simple roll patterns um, that I notated as sixteenth notes, but really it's just a sort of sonorous sound um, and I wanted to create that meditative quality and at the same time because of how I approach music uh, as a songwriter um, I immediately start thinking about melodic ideas so I sort of laid down this drone on the marimba and then I started to just sing over it um, and eventually like I started to sing that really simple triad sort of melodic content and then changing you know a pitch here or a pitch there and i didn't have to change too much while arranging it from marimba to guitar truthfully it translated almost perfectly from one medium to the other aside from occasionally shifting octaves to better suit the guitar i practically played the piece almost exactly as it was originally composed However, some inherent, really interesting contrasts arose while translating the music to guitar. Of course, the marimba is a fantastic instrument, but unfortunately, it cannot sustain a note for a long period of time. You can roll a note on the marimba to give the impression of a long, sustaining line. But if you were to strike a marimba bar just once, the note decays away pretty quickly. 
Now contrast this with a guitar, which once I pluck a string, I can get a comparatively longer sustain. This was really great with translating Strive to be Happy for a guitar. It means those big expansive chord sections, I really got to let them grow. I really got to let them expand much more organically with those longer sustaining uh, notes.
Nicholas Walker composed Chorale for solo bass in 2012 as a competition set piece for the International Society of Bassists. Coming out of, I grew up in Rochester. Uh, the International Society of Bassists was having a convention in Rochester. Uh, this was the required, they asked me to write a required piece. Um, I wrote this and dedicated it to my mom. Walker is a musical omnivore. He's collaborated with an extensive list of early music, traditional classical, and modern jazz musicians, including Wynton Marsalis, Roger Norrington, Bill Charlap, Paquita de Rivera, and Francois Rabat. He currently leads the double bass program at Ithaca College in Ithaca, New York. I think that there's not actually that many differences between the genres as much as there are similarities. There's many more similarities than there are differences between the genres. Um, similarly, I think, you know, when people talk about improvisation as being some extraordinary thing, I think improvisation is the natural human state we're improvising right now in our discussions. While not typically considered a solo instrument, Chorale is an intricate tour de force that demonstrates the upright bass's inherent versatility. Walker capitalizes on the instrument's abilities through legato melodic lines, bowed chords, harmonics, bow chopping, and plucked pizzicato notes. To have some extended techniques that were useful in the in the competition, but also a, a cheerful, expressive focus that would create a sense of community in the ISB and um, and just be fun to play. So that was that was where I was coming from with it. It opens with three simple chords: C, F, and G, or one, four, and five for the numerically minded, before unfolding into a brilliant harmonic and textural showpiece. Chorale is written as a fantasy, a freeform piece of music that doesn't exactly follow a specific structure. It's meant to sound like an improvisation, like a composition that's being written and developed as it's being played. This flexibility allows the music to flow and turn in really surprising directions, from serene to agitated to joyous and back again. Chorale opens peacefully, almost like a hymn. Traditional classical counterpoint develops alongside complex harmonies akin to jazz before ramping into bluegrass flavored licks. Despite the eclectic journey, everything makes sense. Nothing feels out of place, and every section flows effortlessly into the next. It's difficult to transverse genres without sounding forced, but Corral succeeds in part to Walker's views on the links between different musical worlds. And in terms of genre fluidity, I think that that's largely it is, a, um, is an invention. I mean, one analogy for that is that <clears throat> maybe we might use a different kind of dialect when we're speaking with our grandparents or with our friends, uh, our you know, high school friends at a bar at a reunion or, you know, with um, people on a, in a sporting match that might be different than the dialect we would use if we were being interviewed on NPR about, you know, um, a memorial for somebody, for a fellow colleague or professor or something, right? These are just different dialects that we use. But I don't think that when I'm, you know, speaking in one of those areas, I'm less authentic or less uh, sincere or that I'm less present or completely myself. Um, and I think all of us have these different kinds of dialects and these kinds of modalities of, of communication. Just like with Julio, translating something originally written for four strings to something with six strings meant I had the potential to add notes, thicken up some harmonies, even propose some new harmonic ideas. While this opens up the potential for a lot of freedom, the trouble becomes in figuring out how to do this respectfully. I wanted to honor and elevate the original spirit and sensibility, not just devise some odd, bastardized version for the guitar. Everything I did with my arrangement, I wanted to uh, do with respect towards the original piece and towards the composer. Thankfully, Walker is pretty open and uh, embracing of unique new interpretations of his music. And yeah, I was delighted by how, how it sounded. I mean, there's one part in it, I'll show you. 
think it goes like that or something. It, it's like this kind of, I was feeling it very, I don't know, sort of uh, bluegrass, right? Like that kind of a sound. And, and there's these, uh, there were um, some competitors from China and I can't do it the way that they did it, but it was like kind of like a... Oh. It was like it had, I can't do it like they do, but it had this like Mandarin Chinese music flavor to it that was fantastic and gorgeous, and I could never have written it and would never have thought to include it, and it was exactly the right thing. It was like a sort of a folksy, um, straightforward and simple song approach to it that I liked very much. So yeah, in general, I I like it. I usually love hearing people play it their own way. Thank you. 